Welcome friends to UCSB's faculty lecture series. Today we're excited to welcome Professor Reich to our lecture series. Hi Professor, how are you today? Doing well. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Um, we do have a Q&A box that is available to you. The Q&A box is in your menu bar. You're able to ask questions throughout today's presentation and our Professor Eric will be able to answer those questions throughout. I do want to remind everyone that you are muted and that the chat feature is closed. So the Q&A box is how you can get a hold of us. Professor Reich has been with us at UC Santa Barbara for 30 years. Thanks for hanging in there with us, Professor. And today we're going to go through um, and have a great lecture. So I'll turn it over to you. Welcome. Okay, Kuka, thanks a lot. And welcome all of you to uh, this presentation from, from uh, sunny Santa Barbara. Okay, um, so the... Uh, the slide that you're looking at is one that says a lot of different things. Uh, it's got the title of the talk I'm going to give. Uh, it shows Santa Barbara, a classic aerial view of the point uh, where many people go surfing and I go running a lot. Uh, there's the departmental, uh, there's our building uh, where I spend a lot of my time in. And uh, I like to cook and bake and I'm doing a lot more of that right now. Um, and you see my Meyer lemon tarts up in the top right, and I'm an avid bike rider, and I go up to the top of uh, Lacumba Peak, which is 4,000 feet, and it's where a lot of people who uh, train for things like the Tour de France go, go bike ride, and those, those mountains are the mountains that you see in the picture of the point, but they're just from, from afar. Okay, now before I talk about the title or the topic of this, of, of what I've written here, uh, which is the big focus of my research, although my lab does a couple of other things. I wanted to give you two very quick exposures to um, things I'm doing that have to do with science education. Uh, so they're, they're very short. Um, okay, the first one is, let me see if I got this right. Okay. Um, oh, before I get started, I wanted to do a, uh, we want to test our ability to do polling. I, we're going to do this very, very quickly. There's a couple of polls I'm going to be doing with you. So um, please uh, just answer the question, you know, are, you know, are you a high school student considering and, or are you a transfer student or something else? So um, I can't vote. Yes. They're answering. Yeah, they're, they're working on it. Three, oh, okay. two, one. Got 60% of the vote. Let's see. Fifty-five percent of our friends are other, and forty-one percent of our friends are high school um, graduates looking for the class of twenty-one, Professor. Okay, class of twenty-one. Sorry, class of twenty twenty. Yep. Got it. Okay, I was gonna say, wow. Uh, that's okay. Okay, so um, the first thing I want to talk about was something that um, uh, one of my former professors at, at the UC San Francisco. Um, oh, Kuka, there's a lot of people on this chat. Are you dealing with that or do I have to deal with that? Do, do you I'm see on it the up? chat. You're good. Okay, good. And uh, this is a quote from, from, from uh, Bruce Alberts and he uh, wrote this you know, 11 years ago and I'll read it really quickly for you. The failure of most students and adults to understand how science works despite uh, despite having taken uh, you know, science courses, reveals a serious deficiency in our education system and the failure of students to acquire the logic problem solving skills of scientists with their emphasis on evidence goes a long way to explain why business and industry are so distressed by the quality of our average high school and college graduates. And I think it, this really encompasses a lot of what I do uh, in these two programs or these two efforts that I'm gonna explain to you. Okay, the first one is one that's been, go that's been going on in the, in the US and actually outside of the US for quite some time, about 15 or 20 years. One of the key people who um, has been promoting this is Carl Wyman, and I'll show you something from his, from his work um, in just a second. And basically, it's the idea that the way we've been doing science education, science teaching at the university level can be changed. And actually, that can be true at the K through 12 level as well. And the idea is to get students more involved in the process of, of, of science so that they really understand why it's a very interesting and different way of, of looking at the world and looking at evidence. And this is a uh, study, this is actually a paper that um, the title is Active Learning Increases Student Performances in, or Performance in Science, Engineering, and Mathematics. 
And the key idea is, here is active learning. And this was a, 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 from another paper by Carl Weinman. Again, he's a physicist, Nobel laureate. Um, and he shows here in, in a uh, study of a large physics class, I think it's at the University of British Columbia, uh, where the control performance of, uh, of the students is, is, is in this faint gray, and then the experimental is skewed way to the right, meaning that they, the, the people who got the active learning instruction in this physics class um, did much better than conventional lectures. Okay, so then, um, I started this about 10 years ago, and I'm not a physicist, I'm a biochemist. And I uh, published a paper last year, yeah, last year with uh, a statistics professor at UCSB, in which we demonstrated that um, when I did the same thing and, and other things that was done in that, in that physics series uh, for my bio, upper division biochem class, that the students did much better than um, the performance of similar students uh, being given the same final and the, uh, by, uh, uh, by two colleagues of mine at UCSB, and you'll see that in just a second. But what is this approach? Very briefly, um, it's focused on a lot of online questions that students uh, take before the class meets. I look at their performance. I guide the questions that are going to be talked about in class based on their performance on those, that reading material and those online questions. Then in the classroom, we have small group discussions. They then uh, present their logic as to why they chose certain answers from other questions that are related to the ones they took online. This is all done through a technique called eye clickers. There's a lot of argumentation and I, they see me respond and explain things to, to them. Um, and there's very limited lectures. And so in my case, um, uh, my results are uh, uh, in blue here and the, student, uh, and the students in the other class given by my colleague, uh, Kevin Flaxco are in red. And you can see that the, the students in the treatment class, which is my class, did at least 10% better than the control, which is the conventional lectures. And so the same thing was done with another um, uh, professor. So the bottom line here is that it works. Now, one of the key things that, um, that we do in that class is we get people, I get people to think about how to design experiments, how to interpret results, look at evidence, et cetera. So here's a question for you. Here's a typical design question I would have for the students. I just gave this to them in about uh, a week ago. The incidence of, of gastric cancer varies throughout the world. For example, it is four times more prevalent in Japan than in England. Korean men and women are seven times more likely to have gastric cancer as Caucasians. And now this refers to the numbers when those people are living in, in those countries. So one proposed cause is the consumption of foods preserved with nitrates and nitrides. Now, what kind of study can you propose with what outcomes to determine if this has a genetic basis? So I'm, I'm gonna make it easier for you because the students in this case were not given multiple choice. They were just, it was an open-ended free response question. But in this case, the second poll for today is here. So take a look and answer A, B, or C as to what you might think is the best way to do the experiment to, to address that, that question. The answers are coming in, Professor. Let's see. All right. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Um, okay, let's see. And the answers are, oh, people are still answering. All right, you get one more chance. Cool. <laughs> All right, you've got 23% believe it's A, 27% said B, and 50% said C. Interesting, interesting. That's very interesting. Um, so first of all, I want to warn you, that, and this is frustrating for a lot of students, that there really isn't a definitive correct answer here. Okay, <laughs> welcome to the world of doing science research. Um, and uh, the one that has been done and which led to a pretty strong, e strong evidence that, that it, it, it's not genetic, it actually is environmental, is the, uh, and this, those of you who are interested, you can contact me and I'll show you the paper, it's B. 
they, uh, to, to determine if Asians who moved to the US or, or Europe show the same lower level of stomach cancer observed in Caucasians. Now I'm gonna give you one, one quick, uh, oops, sorry, one quick paper or something that helps you understand this. Now, this is a long time ago. This is a paper that I use in another class I teach on, on experimental design and critical thinking. And that has to do with uh, this uh, uh, paper called Strong Inference. And basically the idea is, the way you really do good science is you come up with various hypotheses. You design experiments that can distinguish those hypotheses. And the most powerful thing, and this is something that all of you can remember and use when you argue with your family members about anything, is try to punch holes with evidence against the, the, the hypotheses of the other person rather than finding more evidence that supports your perspective. The, the classic thing that people do, and I do it as well, is you try to come up with more evidence that supports your interpretation. In, in, in contrast, if you find evidence that's inconsistent with the alternative, that is by far the most powerful way to do science. So. I'm gonna keep on going. I, we don't have enough time for me to go into this more. Uh, and if, if uh, I think Kuka said that you're gonna have access to this uh, video in the future, you can go about, you can come back to this and take a look at some of my, my explanation down here at the bottom. Okay, the second thing before I get into my, the actual topic is a program which I started uh, quite a while ago. I had a video, you can go to this website, Sidetrack, and, and you can see the video. This is a program which I started, like I said, about 10 years ago with a, a few other people. And we've now gone out to a lot of local K through 12 kids. We now go into high schools. And the idea is to try to get these, these students to actually do science, but their questions with their design, their experiments, and they repeat it and then they argue about it and then they present a poster on it. And it turns out that we, uh, this program is now run by two to 300 UCSB students. It is uh, the biggest um, outreach that there is at UCSB. It's a very distinctive program. And we publish our results in science um, education journals. So that's all I'm gonna say about Sidetrack. That's, that's this other thing. Okay, here we go. Ah, one thing I thought that would be interesting because many people get confused by this is what is biochemistry? I'm a biochemist. Um, and biochemistry is kind of in that in-between world of chemistry and biology. So I thought I'd give you some two, two very personal examples that um, convey this pretty well. One is, uh, uh, it's a disease, it's, it, it, it's, it's a, well, it's, it's a problem that is oftentimes found in newborns. It's called hyperbilirubinemia. Jaundice is another name for it. And what happens, this story is it's very quick, but it's, it involves all the things that make biochemistry special. It involves understanding how genes get turned on and off. It's uh, it, it, um, why certain molecules are toxic. It, it relies on a lot of uh, physical chemistry, which has to do with the light activation. You'll see that in a second. And it has the biomedical hook, which is very much a biochemical signature. And that is it started with a very observant nurse in the 1950s. So what's the story? Newborns are oftentimes jaundiced. A high percentage of newborns are jaundiced and premature babies are even more likely to be jaundiced. They have yellow skin, they have yellow eyes. Why? Well, um, the, 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 the yellowing comes from a molecule you'll see in just a second that, that is de derived from the thing that makes your blood red, which is, which is heme. Now, it turns out that the reason that these babies are um, jaundiced is because they don't need to process the heme. They don't need to uh, get rid of the heme until they're born because uh, up until that point, they're in their, you know, their, their fetus and they're inside their mom. And so it's only when they come out that they need to be able to process the, the heme. Now, what's amazing is that this leads to serious brain damage if the baby's not treated. Okay, so the key here is, and I, I apologize for those of you who find these kind of molecules, uh, this kind of stuff kind of, you know, difficult to follow, but basically this is what biochemistry is all about. So heme is the stuff that makes your, your, your blood red and your body needs to degrade this at some point because there's a lot of turnover of red blood cells and other things. And the way you do it is you make, oh, uh, Kuga, can they see my pointer? Yes. 
Okay, cool. So, uh, so, this, so what's going on here is that the heme is being degraded down to a molecule called biliverdin, and then eventually what happens is, is the biliverdin is uh, made so that it's more water soluble, so you can pee it and you can poop it out, and that's how it gets out of the body. It turns out that this molecule is a neurotoxin. It causes brain damage, so you need to get rid of it. So what happens is that um, the, this, this is the molecule, the same molecule you see over here, but what the, the way you make it so that it's more water soluble and can be uh, excreted out of the body is through the, the, uh, the attachment of two molecules that are derived from glucose, okay? They're called glucuronic acid, it doesn't matter, but they look like glucose. And you can see that they're charged, oh, where's my pointer? They're charged and they basically make this, this, this uh, very toxic neurotoxin that comes from heme into something that is very water soluble and can be urinated out. Okay, so that's the key. Now, what did this nurse do? Well, she didn't know all this biochemistry, but she, she observed that by putting the babies outside in the sunlight, that these babies went from being jaundiced to non-jaundiced. They no longer had yellow skin and yellow eyes. Now, unbeknownst to her, she was saving these people from brain damage when, when you know, later on in their 20s. What's going on? Well, so just for those, just to be, to really hammer this home. If you go to a, 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 a hospital where newborns are being born, you'll see a, a lot of them are under these UV lights. And the reason is, it's the same reason why this worked for this, uh, this nurse, is because the chemistry, what, what happens is, is that the UV light causes a, a change in the structure of this molecule so that even though they can't urinate it out because of this, they, they lack this, they can urinate it out because there's an isomerization, a change in the structure of this molecule by light that allows that molecule to be urinated out. And, and excuse me. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, there was just somebody that came by here and started talking to me. Um, so anyway, the point here is, is that um, this connects everything. And oh, the reason it's personal is because one, I worked on this enzyme when I was a graduate student. It's one of my first projects. So I was working on this and I had to explain to the doctors who, when my, when my daughter was born, some of the underlying biochemistry, I'm sure they had it when they were in medical school, but they probably forgot it. But what's amazing is that my daughter was definitely in this kind of situation and it was very amazing and gratifying to know the biochemistry. So the other one is very short too, or, and this has to do with uh, trying to convey to you, and one of the reasons why I got a degree in, in, in drug design is many people are, they don't really understand how medicines are discovered. And one of the key things is that much of this happens in universities. And the, it, it, this is what I mean by academic research. So yes, there are pharmaceutical companies. Yes, there's biotech. But it's way too risky for most of those companies to be hunting for new pathways and new, and new enzymes and things like that. Um, I don't have time to go into the explanation for the, the story behind the, excuse me, the Obgene and Amgen. It's a beautiful story of, of how Amgen paid a lot of money for information that came out of an academic lab. It turned out that it didn't apply to humans, but it applied to the mice. But that's the story behind that. But the idea here is that um, you, you get basic discovery being done in academia, and then biotech and pharma capitalizes on that information and actually develops drugs, either, either antibodies, biologicals, or small molecules. Okay, so here's the, here's the actual story. So in the late 70s, a lot of young uh, gay men were dying. There was a new disease that was being identified, and it was effectively a death sentence. In, in a matter of five to eight years, academics discovered what it was, HIV, and more importantly, what were the unique enzymes in that organism that it relied on to cause the T-cell problem that it does. Because as a drug designer, you need to find something distinctive about what it is that you're trying to get rid of, in this case, HIV. Um, in some other cases, it's another pathogen or it's cancer cell, whatever, and then you can exploit that. Uh, that. So the academics laid the groundwork. And then this is sort of a political point, but it wasn't until the late 
uh, 1980s when heterosexuals started getting AIDS and big money flew into this whole process. And that's when pharma was able to jump in and they discovered a lot of very specific molecules that attack these unique enzymes and they came up with a cocktail. The reason this is a personal story is because one of the key discoverers of one of those is my kid brother, Siegfried, who has the same degree and background as I do, although he's more of a chemist than a biochemist. What's the punchline here? The punchline is biochemistry is at the core of these different these two different stories, understanding how normal biology works at the enzyme and protein level, and then exploiting that to lay the groundwork for therapeutics. Okay, here we go. So who is Norbert Reich? Okay, I was born in Germany. Um, I got my degree at Berkeley and then UCSF. I am deep into enzymology, how enzymes work. These are the catalysts inside of cells that do most of the work for, you know, to just pretty much the bio, uh, the, you know, the, the work of the cell. And then I got a PhD in drug design and you know, I've, I've published a lot of papers, I have patents and I'm a member of you know, societies. Um, I have two focuses in my lab. One is on uh, the, the, the topic of today, which is the bacterial and human enzymes that, that change the structure of your DNA. This is in a, a big field called epigenetics um, we're interested in developing antibiotics. Uh, we got to have a big focus on cancer biology and some e effort on human embryonic stem cells. A project I'm not going to talk about at all is a, a, a technology play that we have where we're trying to track proteins in live cells using light. And that's a challenge. It has a lot of basic research implications and drug discovery impl uh, implications. I'm a founder of drug companies and diagnostic companies. Um, I'm the primary designer of the UCSB biochem major. I, and I co-founded Cytric, which I talked about, and I'm very interested in improving science education um, at all levels. Okay, so that's, that's who I am. So, what is epigenetics? This is the most pithy, uh, simple, you know, definition I could find, and there's lots of them out there, but it's the inherited changes that are not caused by your DNA sequence. So all of us in high school biology and wherever in university level, uh, one learns that genetics is driven by DNA sequence. That's the defining feature of the whole, you know, the, the core dogma here. Now, it turns out that epigenetics, epi is on top of genetics, um, is really, it, it, it's somewhat controversial or it was at one point. Uh, some of you might've heard of Lamarck, um, but it's basically the idea that there's more than just the DNA sequence that, that you can pass on to your progeny, to your children. And there's lots of evidence in support of this. Um, and I'm not gonna go through all of this, I'm not a biologist, but the beginning part of what I'm gonna talk about is heavily is heavy on biology. So epigenetics is fundamental to a lot of different forms of life, not just humans and mammals, but it's found in bacteria and plants and it's, it's very, very broadly distributed. And there's lots of different kinds of epigenetics. Uh, in the case of humans or mammals, uh, it's involved in imprinting and a really uh, uh, interesting thing I'm going to just briefly touch on called parent-offspring conflict. Um, and it's been highlighted in Time Magazine and other mainstream journals. There's an environmental response that can cue or drive changes in epigenetics. Uh, those of you who remember Dolly, uh, where they took a, a somatic, uh, so a, a cell from a, an adult, they then took the nucleus out of an unfertilized egg and put that in, and then basically they, they cloned Dolly. And that has an enormous amount of epigenetic both uh, issues and also problems, which is why it's still a challenge um, to do that well. It, it's a very uh, inefficient process. Um, I'll talk about X inactivation, which will hopefully put a smile on all the girls or the women listening here, because it's related to your biology. Uh, stem cell differentiation. Stem cells is a hot topic. It's, it's got epigenetics all over it. It's, it's about the differentiation of a, for example, stem cell. Um, can't see my pointer. The stem cell into different kinds of cells. That's driven heavily by epigenetic phenomena. Um, and then these are called agouti mice. I'll show another slide with them very briefly. And basically the idea there is that um, you can affect uh, these are isogenic uh, mice. They're identical genetically, but you can see phenotypically or how they look, they're different. And that has to do with modulation of the epigenome, not the genome, but the epigenome. 
And for those of you who love watching videos and not having me sit here and explain all stuff to you is uh, there's a great YouTube dated now, but there's a YouTube video called the genie in your genes. And I highly recommend it. Okay, here we go. So this is just, I'm going to only go through two of the biological stories and then I'll go into the kind of work that we do. So all female mammals that includes all girls and women are mosaics. You're, you're just as much of a mosaic as this calico cat. And it's due to the fact that you have two X chromosomes and you only need one. You're, you're a female because you don't have a Y. You're not a female because you have two X's. And so the process of what's called X inactivation and many other organisms do it other ways. It's all, this is part of a broader field called dosage compensation. And the idea here is that you need to find some way to silence one of the X's. And so um, this is done early in development. So this is a two cell stage of, uh, of embryogenesis. And then a, this is a blastula or, and this is where X inactivation is happening in most mammals. It's like, I think in the, in the cat is around the 80 cell stage. So it's a very early process. So think about what has to happen. The female inherits an X from the father and one from the mother. And randomly, and this is key, randomly, those two different chromosomes have to be inactivated. And in fact, that's kind of a key to understanding the calico cat, because what you see there is in one case, the X was from the father and one was the X from the mother. And in the case of the calico, it's color coded and that's why she's tricolor. Okay, let's see. Okay, so what drives this process? I can't see my own thing here, sorry. Let me move this thing. Okay, so this is a, a, a process known as epigenetic silencing in which one of the two X chromosomes is altered. It's, in, it, it's epigenetically modified and, and it's actually modified by the process that I study, which is called DNA methylation. You can think of it as a whiteout so that uh, one of the two X chromosomes is whited out. It's just not going to give out any information whereas the other X chromosome is not. And again, it's random. And the final point about that is like in this case of this, this calico cat, even though this happened here, this, this pattern of which X got inactivated at what point will be propagated for the whole duration of that, of that calico cat's life. So that it's always gonna be the same X got, that got in, inactivated to give you the dark colors and, and you know, you know, et cetera. And that's true for women as well. Uh, this is a cartoon that conveys some of this in a slightly more molecular way. I think I'm going to skip it because I think you're getting the main point of what I'm trying to get across here. And this is a even more kind of detailed, um, but it, it recapitulates a lot of this. So here you have the early stage embryogenesis, and then you have this, this X chromosome in, in, in inactivation. It's, it's occurring in this window. And this just shows you that this, the real point of this slide is actually that mouse, that mice and humans are slightly different in terms of their epigenetics. And actually, for those of you who can do speed reading, you'll see that a lot of this, this color coding down here has to do with some very intriguing processes. This is actually RNA that coats these X chromosomes as they become inactivated. And then, so you have uh, an active X and an inactive X, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The idea here is the randomness of it. Father and mother X inactivated. Now, what's really amazing is, maybe not to you if you have a sense of how basic biology can be, uh, can lead to problems if things don't go right, and so, yes, indeed, there is. There is a, a syndrome called uh, Turner's syndrome. And, and these girls only inherit one X. So I told you before that girls are, or, or females are females because they, um, they don't have the Y and they, don't, they really don't need that second X. But in this case, you're, you're seeing evidence of having only one X. So it's either gonna come from the mother or the father. And so you should be a little bit confused because um, if you only do one X, then why aren't these girls normal? And they're not. There's lots of, uh, I mean, they grow up, and, but they do have a lot of problems. One of the things that they have that will come up in just a second is they have problems in social interactions. Okay, so uh, that's the problem. It affects one in 2,000 girls. It's genetic, but it's not inherited. You'll see in a second. Um, and it leads to developmental problems. And like I said, it's only got one X. And what's amazing is there's been you know, papers written in the lay press, in this case it's the New York Times. It turns out that you can, you can track these girls and you can find out that 
um, if they get the X chromosome from the father, they're actually much better off than if they get the X chromosome from the mother. Now, you might wonder why is that? Because the two Xs are going to be very, very similar. And the answer is in the, what's in the parentheses, imprinting, which is the second biology story I wanted to tell you about. And imprinting is a way that males and females mark their chromosomes, their genetic material differently. So this is not about the sequence. You know, the X chromosome from the father and the X chromosome from the mother could be identical, but the father is going to imprint his X chromosome differently than the mother. And so therefore, if you only get one imprint, you want the imprint from your father, not the imprint from your mother. Okay, here we go. Uh, okay, so uh, you need to understand the difference between somatic and germline. Somatic cells are the ones that make up your, most of your body. Germline are the ones that are found in either the ovaries or the testes. And this is imprinting in a kind of a cartoon fashion. You have a fertilized, uh, so this is fertilization. Here's the, here's the uh, fertilized egg. And then you have a process where you get this uh, uh, you know, embryogenesis. And this is supposed to be the, uh, the male chrom chrom X chromosome. This is the, the female X chromosome from the mother and the father. And what happens is, is that these arrows are supposed to denote that there's different parts of this chromosome. This arrow says, make this gene. This chromosome uh, says, make this gene. You notice they're different, right? Well, that's because this one came from the mother and this one came from the father. Now, it turns out that, uh, quote, normal females have a copy of each and they have imprints from both males and females. Now, why is this important? It turns out that um, this is information that gets passed from one generation to the next, but it turns out that only a very small number of our genes are imprinted not just on the X, but throughout our genomes. And, <clears throat> sorry, the, the normal imprinting is required for normal, or the imprinting is required for normal development. There are other diseases other than Turner's, <coughs> excuse me, that, um, that lead to abnormal development. And these are two of them right in here. They're, this has nothing to do with Turner's, this has to do with imprinting. So here's something that should blow most of, the, most of you, the students' minds. There's a paper, those of you who want it, I can give it to you. It's titled, Mickey Has Two Moms. So you can imagine what they did here. They took, the, they took an unfertilized egg and they took another egg and they changed the imprint on that egg, on the second egg, to be male-like. And then they fertilized the first egg with the second egg. And so there's no sperm. Uh, that led to fertilization. It led to a normal offspring, fertile offspring. You don't need sperm. So this, some people look at this and kind of uh, as a way to ensure that females uh, are, uh, you know, need to get sperm from or, or get the male gamete in because with, without this kind of a safeguard, it's conceivable that, that females could could have offspring in the absence of, 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 a, of a male donor. And sex, I don't want to go into it, but sex is an incredibly powerful driver of evolution and, and it really does facilitate things. So anyway, um, so this is that final piece of the biology. Um, it turns out that this, this parent offspring conflict, this has to do with the fact, I mean, you know, why, why, what's another reason for having imprinting? It turns out that the male imprint, if you look at what imprinting comes from the male, it's mostly about enhancing growth, making sure that, that the male's progeny are going to be robust, you know, grow fast, etc. The female, it's not like, uh, it's not like the imprint is for dwarfs or anything, but it's just the limitation of growth. So, to be normal, the female needs the imprint from both. And so, uh, sorry, here. So, and this is just a molecular explanation because this is actually, an, uh, you know, an actual gene that's involved. So this is why you need to have uh, the X chromosome from the father and the X chromosome from the mother in normal females. Okay, so um, epigenetics, uh, this is the agouti mouse I talked about before. Uh, this is some very cool background examples of how what, uh, what your grandparents did 
this is a beautiful study. What your grandparents did in this context, it was an epidemiology study of, uh, of a famine in the 1940s uh, you know, during the war. And what, is the, what, what happens to the children and what happens to the, uh, um, to the grandchildren? So it's being, there's information passed on to those uh, uh, progeny that has nothing to do with the genetics of those people. It has to do with whether or not they were, uh, you know, how, how badly they were starving during, the, during that famine. Um, okay, I'm not going to go through that because it's too much detail. Okay, so there are three epigenetic mechanisms, okay? One of them is DNA methylation. One of them is histone and chromatin, and another one is RNA. And we study all three, although our focus has been on DNA methylation. So this is a kind of a cool cartoon. And some of you, if you've had biology classes, you've seen this probably in different ways, but this has got a different emphasis than what you're used to. So chromosome, okay? Just for reference, the amount of DNA in one of your cells is about two meters. You have something like 10 to the 13 cells. I could do a math problem here for you guys. I didn't set it up. Is what is the length of the DNA in your cells? And it's multiples of going from here to the sun. It's an amazingly long amount of, uh, of material in your body. Okay, but anyway, the, the chromosome is incredibly compacted in terms of its, of its DNA. You've got to take those two meters and shove it into a 50 micron object called a cell. And so the way you do it, a lot of different things you do, but one of them is you wrap it up in what are called nucleosomes. So the DNA is wrapped around a protein core. Okay. And the, if you keep on, you know, getting closer and closer and closer and closer, what you ultimately see is the famous double helix of Watson and Crick. And now you see these little dots on here, and these are methyl groups. Those methyl groups are put on by a DNA methyl transferase, an enzyme. And that is extremely important to all the things I've just talked about, to imprinting, to X chromosome inactivation, to turning the right genes on during embryogenesis. Uh, when things go wrong, this can lead to an epigenetic cause of cancer that's not mutational, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. The enzyme that does this is a methyltransferase, as I said. We study these, they're called DNMTs. They basically take cytosine within DNA and they put a methyl group onto the C5 position and you get, to get this. This is, the, this is your one dose of actual chemistry here in this, uh, in this talk. Now, I'm gonna show you some structures. These are beautiful structures. They're, you know, they're, they're very accurate. They're, 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 they're obtained from X-ray crystallography, a technique that's been around for 50 years. And what you're looking at is about mm, 200 angstroms. No, no, it's about, it's about five to 20 nanometers across. So it's, a, it's about the same size as one of these nucleosomes. But this is the protein that does this chemistry. And this is the protein that puts the methyl groups on your DNA. This is the protein that makes X chromosome inactivation work. It's called DNMT3A. And it is what we call a tetramer because it has one here, one here, one here, and one here. This is the DNA. This enzyme is methylating the DNA to do this. It does it through this kind of a chemistry. Okay, so this is an enzyme that we study. Now we were perplexed when the structure first came out uh, as to why it's living as what we call a tetramer. It's sitting as a group, it's like a little village of four because most enzymes that methylate DNA act like, like the Lone Ranger. They just act on, all by themselves. So the question is, you know, why? And we're, I'm, I'm gonna show you a little bit about that in just a second because it's a project that I, it's gonna, it, it'll be pretty quick. But so, what does this DNA methylation do? It, occur, it methylates the cytosine, as I just said, and it does it in dinucleotides called CG. So you have a lot of CG uh, base pairs within your DNA. And these sites appear about once in every 80 base pairs in the human genome. But it turns out that they should appear one in 16. So for, the, for those who are math inclined, you might want to ask, ask what do I, why can I say that you should have one in 16? CG dinucleotides, I mean, where does that number come from? And, and then this is an interesting problem because we have a five-fold underrepresentation. That's, that's sort of an aside. Now, normal DNA, you have to look at all the, the, the guides here. So this is an unmethylated CG site, this, this open lollipop. This red lollipop has got a methyl group in the, in the way that I just explained earlier. So what's going on here in normal DNA, you have an unmethylated gene and this is going to, uh, or 
uh, parts of the genome are unmethylated. And what's going on here is that that's a nice balance, that's what this is supposed to uh, denote, between what's called a tumor suppressor, which controls the growth of a, of, of a cell, and an oncogene, which enhances the growth of that cell. So with the right pattern of methylation, the normal healthy pattern of DNA methylation, you have a balance between these two phenomena. However, in a cancer cell, instead of getting a mutation, which does occur and can lead to cancer, in this case, what you've got is a altered epigenome and the methylation pattern in front of some critical genes, in this case, it's a tumor suppressor, is inappropriate and it's turning this gene off. That's what this, this denotes. This gene is off. This gene is still on. This gene was on, this one's off, this one's on, this one's off. When you have this situation, the, the, the level is messed up and you now uh, in, enhance the, uh, you know, the tumor genesis of that cell and that leads to all kinds of problems. Neoplasia, metastasis, and then relapses. And I don't wanna go into all that because there's not enough time. But this is the core of how epigenetics can lead to problems. And I thought it was really amazing my wife uh, got a subscription to the National Geographic a couple of years ago, and I was just looking at the issue that just came out. So this is a current issue of National Geographic, and they make reference to a science article. And what they basically say is that there are genes that are found in humans. Th these are, for example, the genes I just talked about. These, these, these two genes are these classes of genes that control growth. And it turns out that those genes are enhanced in deer when they want to grow their antlers really, really fast. What's the point I'm trying to make? Is that the, these, these genes that can lead to problems are actually genes that we use to our advantage under certain circumstances. And this is a very specific example of deer, but it still is applicable. Okay, so here's a close-up of that. Incidentally, the color coding is human. The, I mean, um, it's done by you know, computer graphics, the, the actual proteins don't have these colors, but this is what those proteins look like. Um, okay, so uh, now this is a very quick project. I don't have much time left. Um, and so this is a project where we looked at this protein, this X-ray structure of the protein. And we wanted to ask the question, you know, is the structure, this structure important? Do you need to have a tetramer? Could just one of these guys work? So how would you do that? So how would you investigate that? So I could have asked this as a question, but I'm gonna give it to you guys. I'm gonna walk you through it. The way we did it is we looked at this interface between this monomer and this monomer, and this is a close-up. And what we asked is, if we made amino acid changes that look like they're important for stabilizing this interface, would that affect the ability of this thing to form this tetramer? And if the answer is yes, then we could ask the question, well, is the, is, for example, is the dimer active? Is the monomer active, et cetera? So it turns out we did that, and we found that there was no change in the ability of the monomer or the dimer to methylate DNA. This was surprising to many, many people, because usually when you see a structure like this, your, your inclination is to believe that it's important. Well, it could be important, but it wasn't important just for methylation. So then what we did is we looked and we found out that this mutated form of the enzyme or these mutant forms of the enzyme were no longer able to repeatedly methylate the same piece of DNA. What do I mean by that? Well, take a look here. This is the enzyme that's found in your body. It forms a tetramer. It binds DNA. It, it goes to the DNA. It, it, puts a, it puts a methyl group. That's what the, the popsicle is. It puts a methyl group on. And this is key. It keeps on moving and it keeps on methylating all the other uh, uh, places where it can methylate in that same region. This is super efficient and essential. It turns out that the mutant form of the enzyme, these ones that were engineered, can no longer do that. They can methylate perfectly well, but then they just leave. Now, why was that? So that was interesting. That's very biophysical, biochemical, but it turns out that right at the time that we published this, there were some papers that came out in the New England Journal of Medicine, which showed that leukemia patients, and now it's been shown in other cancers, have mutations in this enzyme I've been talking about, the DMT3A, and they all appear in this region that's right here, all these regions that we mutated. So amazingly, and the same kind of side chains or amino acid substitutions. So what's pretty impressive is that we were able to kind of fall into a, a, a or, or provide a molecular explanation for the people who are studying this form of leukemia as to why or how these mutations in this gene 
could lead to problems because although the enzyme can methylate, the patterns of methylation are all messed up in these patients. And that turns out to be really, really key. And this just shows you that the mutations in these patients are way over uh, represented um, in the enzyme that we are studying compared to, these are like the, this is like the who's who of cancer genes. And uh, these are much less mutated than, uh, or affected than the enzyme that we study. Um, so Kuka, you're gonna, what are, is it like, uh, you're doing I, right. You're doing all right. People are hanging in there with you. Keep going, Professor. Okay. So the next. Uh, so then I had another student uh, who who joined about four years ago who followed up on this. And I don't know if the audience is is can is a, uh, understands this, but the Human Genome Project uh, happened before most of the people, most of the students who are online right now were born. Two thousand, two thousand one. But what's amazing is that nowadays. That has dropped in price so dramatically that when you go to a cancer ward, or if you go, you know, I, I, you know, I, I work with biomedical researchers in other places, uh, MD Anderson in Texas, et cetera. What you find is that they're sequencing everybody so that you can get amazing amount of information now. Thousands and thousands of, of patients have gotten their DNA sequenced. So we know a lot about what, what other kinds of changes these patients have that drive their their disease and so it turns out that this next student Jonathan Sandoval what, where he picked up on this was he he then made uh, the same changes um, in the same enzyme but now they weren't driven by looking at these interfaces that I told you about from the previous student this student now Jonathan is looking at the patient uh, mutations and what he found was really surprising one he found that some of the mutations caused the enzyme to be more active. <laughs> which just surprised the heck out of us. And then of course, there's a lot of uh, inactivating mutations. That wasn't so surprising. But the other thing that he found out that was interesting is that, now I didn't make a big deal about this, but this is the tetrameric protein, but these proteins out here can be swapped out. There are other proteins that can be put in place of this one that control this enzyme. And it turns out that these mutations differentially affect how these partner proteins, which oftentimes are tumor specific, if you have breast cancer, if you have ovarian cancer, or if you have testicular cancer, there will be different partners that are con controlling the enzyme. And so these mutations talk to those other partner proteins and affect how they can regulate this enzyme. And that was a surprise. So where are we going? Um, we're looking now at how DNA methylation is affected by regulatory proteins, RNA, and histones. But also we're trying to develop new and better drugs that interfere with how the, this, this human enzyme is regulated by uh, these partner proteins. Why? One of the biggest problems in drug design is what's called off-target toxicity, meaning you can develop a potent inhibitor and a potent drug that does what you want. Unfortunately, it will also have side effects that can be limiting to the point where you can't actually apply it to patients. Now, that gets a little bit sketchy in cancer, but in reality, that's still a big problem. And that comes because the, 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 the therapeutic you've developed doesn't just go for what you want. It goes for, what other, it goes for unintended things. And so the idea here is to be more specific. So what we're trying to do is disrupt the regulation of this epigenetic enzyme by interfering with how these, these other partner proteins are regulating its function. Okay, uh, I, can, I have a choice here, uh, Kuga, or uh, the audience. We can, pay, we can ask the audience or you. Um, I can talk to you briefly about a bacterial project, or I can go very quickly to this last slide, which is about opportunities for undergraduates at UCSB. So this is kind of a plug for UCSB. Maybe what I'll do is this one first, and anybody who wants, I can keep on talking about the bacterial project. So here we go. This is my last slide, or second to the last slide. Okay, so UCSB. Now, this is a story about me and, and, and what I've done, but you can imagine there are other professors that are also doing this kind of thing at UCSB, because you'll see that it's not distinctive to me, although I, I'm pretty proud of what I've done with undergraduates as well as PhD students. So I've had over 100 undergrads work with me, in the, in the, and these are people who've done actual research in my lab. 35 of those undergrads have published papers. Now, just to put this in perspective, there are people who have gone to medical school and PhD programs who probably got in there because they published a paper, because that distinguishes you from just getting you know, a 4.0 and doing great on the GREs or the MCATs or whatever it is, because you have shown you have the capacity to do something beyond just get good academic scores. 
And UCSB is pretty special. I mean, I, I was at Berkeley as an undergrad and it was very challenging to get into a research lab. There's a lot of people, a lot of undergraduates do research um, in, in research labs at UCSB. And that's a distinguishing feature about getting into any of those other programs. So where are these people now? Now, obviously I'm not gonna give you all hundred of these people, but this is just a highlight of some of them. So Lino Gonzalez, He's a senior scientist at 23andMe. Some of you might know about that company. Celeste Holtz, she's a vice president at Impossible Foods, which some of you might know about. Uh, Rick uh, is a senior scientist at Lilly. Dan is the CSO. That's the chief scientific officer at a publicly traded fate therapeutics. It's a pretty big deal. Fraser is a professor. Ben is a professor. Javin's a professor. And there's a long list of students that have gone on and gotten their MDs after coming out of my lab. Aaron, uh, UCSF, Dean, um, I forget where Dean went and Ramsey was at USC. So those are the, that's just representative. So I think, I think UCSB is pretty special in this regard. And this is my last slide. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm a big bike fan, et cetera, et cetera. And I will go back. Let's just say that what we found with a bacterial enzyme that is a human pathogen is an amazingly cool result. And it was published in, a, in one of the high profile journals called Nature Communications. And this is the structure of that protein. It's a dimer, you've got blue and green, here's the DNA. But the mind blowing thing about this protein is that this is what it does to DNA. So this is double stranded DNA and it takes one strand and completely pulls it out. And it does the chemistry out here. And then after it's done, it shoves it back in here. That's never been seen before. It's a totally novel way for a protein to uh, interact with DNA and to, and to recognize a, a particular sequence, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, I went fast. I have a lot of stuff I, I, you know, I'm pretty happy to talk to you guys about. I think that's it, so. Professor, you've got two questions in that Q&A box. Wanna filter through those? Okay, uh, let's see here. I'll go here, Q&A. Okay, Thomas Allen. Does imprinting take place on the Y chromosome as well? Uh, I can't say that definitively, but their uh, imprinting occurs on throughout the uh, throughout the chromosomes. It's not just the X. The X is special, um, and it's for a lot of reasons. But um, it, it, imprinting is not just localized to the sex uh, chromosomes. So. Let me see, what kind of exposure leads to cancer via DNA methylation? Ah, well, okay. So um, the way that cancer biologists think about this is that there's a genetic component and there's an epigenetic component. And oftentimes they kind of layer on top of each other. So think of it, there's a great, um, it's now very old. It's called, I think it's called the Knudsen hypothesis, the two hit hypothesis. And the idea is, is that why is it that cancer doesn't develop in humans until pretty late in life, 50s, 60s, 70s, in general, unless it's familial inherited uh, form of cancer. And the answer is you need a lot of hits. So some of those hits are genetic and then some of those hits can be epigenetic. So they work together, whatever, whatever gives the, the tumor cell an advantage in terms of growth phenotype. That's how you have to look at it, is that it's a growth phenotype of, you know, it, it, it wants to, two features. One is immortal, the other one is uh, un uncontrolled growth. It doesn't respond to having neighbors and saying, chill out, slow down. It just keeps on growing. And so there could be epigenetic components to that and there can be genetic components. I don't know of an example. Okay, here's, or here's one example. Okay, familial uh, breast cancer, the BRCA gene. Um, that is a, a very unfortunate circumstance where a woman inherits muta a mutated BRCA gene. Or, or, and there it's very, very uh, predictable what the health outcome from that will be at a relatively early age. However, if you take a look at women who, who get sporadic breast cancer, the, you know, the, the vast majority of women who do get breast cancer don't get it in their 30s and 40s, and they get it much later. It turns out that the mutations that lead to the, um, to the breast cancer that's familial, that's inherited, is not the one that drives most of the breast cancer later on. And in fact, epigenetics plays a major role in breast cancer later in life. So it's, it's not one or the other, it's a blend. 
Uh, why does the methyl group bind only to cytosine? So the enzyme is very specific. The enzyme, uh, there are cytosine methyltransferases and there are adenine methyltransferases. And enzymes are amazingly cool, which is why I'm an entomologist. And that is that they're so specific. They are, they're catalysts, but they're very, very specific. The enzyme that I talked about, the bacterial enzyme, it makes one mistake in 10 million. It is just unbelievable. So it, that enzyme happens to be an adenine methyltransferase. And it's very specific to a very specific sequence. And it doesn't make very many mistakes. Uh, can you go back over why uh, the cat had three colors and that whole process? OK. So like I said, women are mosaics. I kid my two daughters and my wife a lot about that. And, but you don't see it. And because you don't see, it's not color linked. Uh, okay, I'm not a geneticist, but I can tell you that there are color linked uh, changes at the gene level. So that what happens is, is that um, instead of just being a mosaic and having an X chromosome uh, uh, being inactivated from the father and from the mother, which is random and is, it appears in all female mammals, in the case of the uh, calico cat, that process is color linked, meaning that if you inactivate the father's X, you might, and I don't know what the answer here is, you might be orange. If you inactivate the mother's X, then you might be black. And then I, and then I, I don't know where the tricolor, I don't know where the third color comes from. It must be some, some other possibility or something, but, but it's color linked. Okay, so does DNA acetylate a me, a play a role in the regulation of oncogenes and tumor suppressor genes also? So DNA doesn't get acetylated. Uh, not by an enzyme. I'm not, I'm, I don't know if this person, this anonymous attendee wrote this. Uh, I, I'm not sure if you meant methylation, but I'm not sure. So I'm not sure what, I'm, I'm not sure how to answer that question. Um, <laughs> well, that's a good way to wrap up with any final comments, Professor, then, since that wraps up our questions. Okay. Uh, final comments from me? <laughs> So final comments to our friends, ladies uh, and gentlemen. Oh, Catholic. okay. Uh, <laughs> all right. Okay. Well, here, I hope you, uh, I hope you come to appreciate epigenetics. I hope you come to appreciate that there's more than just doing science at, at UCSB because I'd like to do a lot of these other things. I hope that you see that there's a lot of other opportunities just then the science part of it because that's the, the STEM and the other things I talked about the, uh, I'm sorry, the outreach. And uh, if you're making, you know, I, I think UCSB is a really neat blend of high, high end science research, but also it's got a lot of great opportunities for undergraduates, which is not the case if you take a look at uh, too big of a place or too small of a place. And I could get into that with people, but um, you know, it's, it's that middle ground, you know, 20,000 students, three or 4,000 PhD students, you know, it's, it's very, dis very uh, particular niche that we have. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, okay. a round of applause. Yay. So okay. we, we thank you for joining us on this faculty lecture and remind you that Mondays and Thursdays, our lectures will be here. Did you miss it? Did you want to watch it again? It's on our YouTube playlist off of our faculty lecture page where you registered for today. So once again, thank you for joining us, everyone. This recording will be posted by the end of the week. All right, everyone. Have a great evening.